Welcome to Wellspring on the Air. I'm Mario Diarmas, a therapist here at Wellspring and the host of today's show titled, How to Talk to Our Kids About Mental Health. Joining me today is Nicole Velez Alfonso, and it's so good to have you here today, Nicole. Thank you, I'm happy to be here. Absolutely, we have so much to talk about and so much to broach within you know, the, the topic at hand. So please stay with us. We've got some needed conversations about mental health and how to talk to our kids about this relevant and important topic. But first, before we start, uh, Nicole, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. So um, I am a mental health counselor here in Florida. I've been uh, licensed for about 13 years and I've been working for Wellspring for six years. Um, I really love um, helping people. Um, my love for it started when I was like 16 years old and I had my own struggles with mental health. I am married for 15 years and have two awesome kids that definitely keep me on my toes and all the topics <laughs> that are covered. So yeah. I'm sure, wide range. <laughs> yes. Awesome, Nicole. No, you, you definitely carry with you a passion and a kindness and there's no mistaking that you're so enthusiastic about this topic. So I'm gonna start with the basic question uh, regarding this, which is what is mental health? Yes, so let's get to the, to the definition of that because um, mental health is the overall wellness of how you think, regulate your feelings and behave, right? And so a mental illness or a mental health disorder is defined as patterns or change in thinking or feelings and behaviors that can cause distress and disrupt your personal ability to function in all your roles. Correct. And then having this information, why is it important to have this discussion with our kids? So the short answer to that question is we need to be that safe place for our kids to come, right? That's just the short one, right? We, we don't want our kids to not feel like they can come to us for any topic, but in particular, their mental health, right? And so I'd like to start off with a startling statistic just to put things a little bit in perspective. According to NAMI, which is the National Alliance of Mental Illness, the second leading cause of death in ages 10 to 34 is suicide. So clearly our children and teens are struggling with mental health. We know that obviously because of a, this pandemic that, that we are thankfully uh, starting to get out of, but um, we really do need to be as parents, the safe place for our kids to come to talk to about mental health. Um, too many times uh, in our therapy rooms, we hear teens say, I don't want to tell my parents this, or I don't want to talk to my parents about this. I don't want to worry my parents, right? And so we want to make sure that we are telling our kids, I am the, the best person, and no matter what you bring to me, we're going to do the best to help you, right? Yes. Because the truth is we all need to manage our mental health. Like, you know, children and teens are not the only ones. Adults, we all have mental health to manage. How do we really live an abundant life, right? And, and not struggle um, in, in our world, which obviously we have struggles, but how do we find that, that good balance and self-care to do our best? So we need exactly. to be teaching our kids skills and strategies and um, on how to do that because the thing that happens is that when we do not know what to do health in a healthy way, we will go for the unhealthy, destructive things and habits, right? So we'll do, like kids will do the alcohol and drugs, the vaping, right? For numbing and avoiding emotions and feelings. They'll do the social media obsessing, right? They'll also do the video gaming. Um, they'll do self-harm and cutting and there'll be disordered eating and all these different ways that kids will find to manage emotions that are not actually facing them and finding good, good strategies. So we really have to be that front line for them. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And behavior is that, that byproduct of what's happening internally, 
right? So exactly right. It, it, those outward behaviors that we see is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm struggling inside with stuff that I don't know what to do with. So this is what I'm going to do with it. You know, another yeah. important, really important thing that we, a lot of people do not know, and I didn't know this until I did the research as well, is that 50% of people will be diagnosed with mental Ill, with a mental health condition by the age of 14. So wow. 50% of, of any mental health diagnosis is, is by the age of 14 and 75% by the age of 24. And so again, we need to be looking uh, for red flags. We need to be looking to see what's going on um, underneath underneath right underneath it all and yeah. all the things that surround our kids nowadays the, the reality of social media video games the proclivity now for self-harm mm -hmm. there's so many things involved now that we 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 tend to avoid that uncomfortable conversation but it's in fact so imperative that we could just tackle that head on with the kids and create that ambiance for dialogue mm -hmm. yeah. and education yeah. And one of the things that happens in our culture is now that this is becoming more normal, like it's more normalized to be like into video games and play video games all the time or be on social media all the time. But really, there is a fine line and we need to be watching for it. Yeah, 100 you percent. Know? And, and parents carry that need to have authority, right? Parents need to have structure around the house and authority. But at the same time, I appreciate the difficulty because you also need to be approachable. Yes. And how do you sustain that balance? Yes. And, and that's going to lead me into, you know, I will talk about that in, in this show about uh, being approachable and sharing some of your own experiences. Uh, I think it really helps kids they feel like, oh, my parent isn't this perfect person that has it all together. Like they also have struggled with things and that makes it even more um, easy for them to come, come to us. And Nicole, where do we start in terms of talking about this? Where so, do parents begin? Yes. Yeah, so I, I would say that the start is to talk about our feelings, right? Um, and this is might be a little awkward for some people like, no, we don't do feelings in our home. Well, guess what? You should. <laughs> we need to be doing some feelings talk. I do recommend you print out a feelings wheel, have one around the house, have around one in the car. So we do need to have conversations and model an approach about talking about mental health. So um, talking about feelings really helps that. So some of you listening might say, well, man, I don't really even know what I'm feeling half of the time. Well, this is really good reason to start paying more attention to your feelings because um, we need to teach through example and we need to be, you know, we could say things like, um, how was your day? And the usual, of course, the usual answer is good, like very short and sweet. <laughs> But it's your chance to say, I'm really glad that you had a good day. I actually had some, some moments of anxiety today, or I felt overwhelmed today. I had high stress today because, you know, this was happening or I had this meeting or whatever. But you know what I did to, to help myself? I went for a walk or I talked to my coworker about it, or I, you know, did some breathing or what, so you're, 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 you know, modeling what it looks like exactly. to handle these feelings, right? Um, and so that's really healthy because you're just, you know, you're using yourself as an example of what you do, um, and teaching that to your kids. Um, so yeah, so we start with feelings. We start about like, we start with having conversations about feelings and how did you feel today? How did you feel before the test? And how did you feel after the test? And how did you feel you did in the test? And, you know, you just do do that whole feelings talk and you talk about yourself too and how you handle your own feelings. Um, yes. So that's the first step, having conversations. The second is ask. So asking about their day, asking, doing a daily check-in, you know, uh, in our family, we do a highs and lows. Like what was the best part of the day? What was the worst, worst part of the day? Why, what happened? How did you handle it, right? Um, what did you do? Did it help? Um, so this is really a chance for you to ask and, and, and allow, you know, allow your child to speak to you. Allow that space of, sometimes you do need a little silence 
you know, you ask the question and give them some time to think about it. Um, and it's, a, it's also a chance again, to speak into, um, you know, if you, you know, like if they say, I, I didn't really do anything, like I didn't know what to do. I was just kind of like st sitting there. And, and so you, you can give some options, you know, like some of the things that have worked for me are, you know, talking with someone or taking a break, going to the bathroom and taking some deep breaths, right? Um, exercising, taking a walk, drawing or coloring, or even crying, right? Journaling, different things that you can offer them. And then the next time that something happens to them, they might be able to think of, of these things and say, you know, when my mom mentioned, you know, this, um, I should try it. Um, parents, your kids are listening, whether you think yes. it or not, they are listening. So share what you can with them. Uh, at some point in their in their uh, walk in life, they will access that information. So just share, you know, what works for you and what's been helpful. Yes, I love that idea about modeling because my niece oh, had told me at one point that it really helps her open up to her parents when her parents are vulnerable and open with her. So it's not one sided any longer. That's huge. And I think we don't do that as much as we should as parents. I think we really do need to speak more into, you know, I feel sad. Like sometimes my kids will catch me with tears in my eyes and I said, no, I'm just feeling sad because this, this, and this, you know, it's okay for, for you to feel sad. It's okay. You're, you're just showing that it's okay. I'm going to be okay. I'm just kind of crying it out, you know? Right. And it's okay. Yeah. Yeah, and it's it's good that you had mentioned two options because there are all types of personalities. I'm the one that I need to talk about it and I need to repeat it and I need the sounding board yeah. and get ready. Because if you ask me how I'm doing, <laughs> I'm not going to say it's good and you, I'm going to let it go. But yeah, you were mentioning different options and journaling for the person who's more reflective that way. It's, yeah, it's some are not talkers. Able. You know, right. some need to write it down. Um, some need to draw or, you know, so yeah. There's, it's true, you, 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 you really hit on something important. Um, we can't expect our kids either to do it the way we do it, right? And so we need to give them some options. Absolutely. And why do you think it is that talking about feelings and working through our feelings is so important? So we, we need to remember that feelings are messengers. And sometimes we forget that, that, that's, that, that they're there for a reason, right? They have a purpose and we need to listen to that and act accordingly. So they're our guide and they help us li live better lives. The problem we encounter is that we do not know what to productively do with those feelings, right? And exactly. so we wanna do the unproductive stuff and we wanna do the numbing and the stuffing and the avoiding and the medicating and the dumping feelings on other people. And so um, that is why feelings talk is so important because we don't want to do the numbing. We don't wanna do the stuffing because what happens is that ultimately it will come out and it will come out in ugly ways and in right. unproductive ways. So right. we do really have to pay attention to the feelings. So, yeah. Right. No, that it'll eventually boil over. So being present to that emotion and sharing the emotion. And you said it so beautifully before, like acknowledging it. Yeah. And then it runs its course. But repressing it oftentimes leads to the behaviors and to that delayed release, which is oftentimes a little more problematic. Exactly. So, yes. Can you share some important principles about feelings that parents should keep in mind uh, when it comes to sharing with their kids? Yes. Yeah, so um, this is some of the awesome information we share in our Bounce program, but feelings, um, there's some principles that are really important to keep in mind. Feelings are not right or wrong, right? They're messengers of what's happening. So let's be very mindful of not telling our kids, you shouldn't feel that way or you know, you're making a big deal out of it. You know, those are not helpful because um, it makes the feelings kind of grow. And so, and, and become defensive and become more angry. And so I think it's really important. Feelings are not right or wrong. They're just messengers about what's happening around us. Exactly. Second is feelings show us what we believe. So um, if we, for example, are in a situation where, um, there is a, you know, let's say there's like a, a scary animal around us. Um, and 
no okay no let's say that there's a lizard let's say there's a lizard and um your child is very very scared of lizards right and they think they think that the lizard is going to bite them right so they're scared the feeling is scared and the belief is that the lizard is going to bite them now the belief might be incorrect exactly right the belief might be incorrect but the feeling is is they're they're feeling you know they're feeling scared so we feelings show us what we believe if we believe that the lizard is going to bite us then our feeling is going to be a fear right so we need to be mindful of are we are we really believing uh, truth right are we believing things that are real and true or are we um our thoughts telling us things that are not true and then uh, you know creating feelings of anxiety depression and all all these other things so feelings show us what we believe Feelings also should be proportionate and appropriate to what's happening. So what that means is that if you get a, if you get a little um, paper cut, you're not going to be yelling and screaming like a crazy person, right? Because that's not appropriate or proportionate. But if someone passes away, you definitely will have strong emotions, right? You will be crying. You will be upset. Now, would we, what wouldn't be uh, proportionate to that would be that if you're not, you're, you're kind of like, no feelings, right? That wouldn't be proportionate to someone's passing away. It would be appropriate and proportionate to have strong feelings about that. So that's just, uh, feelings always go somewhere that, so they do wait to be felt. This is really important. Just because we numb and stuff and avoid doesn't mean they will not come out. They will. It's just not gonna be predictable and it won't be pretty. Um, Feelings help us take actions we need to, right? So when we are angry, there's been an injustice. We want to speak up, right? Or we want to say something or we need to set a boundary. So feelings do help us know what to do next in a situation. Um, and lastly, and the one that we really often say a lot is let them come and they will go. Exactly. Meaning allow your feelings to come, allow you to sit yourself with your feelings, allow yourself to cry your feelings, allow yourself to punch the pillow if you need to, because you have anger and it will go away. Eventually feelings do not stick around forever. And that's really important for us to know, because when we're having strong feelings, we feel like we're, they're never going to go away, but they do. And so these are just really important principles for parents and, and kids to know. Yeah, because unfortunately, people wind up judging their feelings and based on an expectation, of whether it's a cultural scenario, we, we give it a label as opposed mm. to acknowledging and letting it come so that we can let it go. So this is such good stuff, Nicole, and uh, I am excited about continuing this conversation. We're going to take a brief break and be back shortly. Welcome back to Wellspring on the Air. This is Mario Diarmas. If you're just joining our show, our topic today is how to talk to our kids about mental health. So far, we've talked about why talking about feelings is so important. And Nicole has given us various points of information and stats uh, that are very relevant to this topic. If you joined us late, you can find us on your favorite podcast channel on Wellspring on the Air or on our website blog page at wellspringmiami.org. Just search for this topic. So Nicole, as we continue this uh, conversation, what are, what are other ways parents can educate their kids about mental health? So conversation is different in education, right? Because now this is, we're talking about educating them about what are some of these mental health conditions, right? And so asking them, do you know what depression is and anxiety and ADHD looks like in people? Um, having conversations, have, have you ever felt depressed or anxious? And there being a difference between having sad days and actual depression, right? So clarifying that, um, asking, do you know any friends who struggle with depression or anxiety? Um, and how do you know they, that they're depressed? What do you see in them, right? So give them some concrete explanations as to what it looks like. You know, when people feel depressed, some of the things they can feel are unmotivated. They don't want to do the things that they used to. Maybe they start isolating. They don't want to hang out with the friends anymore. Um, also, they may cry more often, get angry or irritated more frequently. They're kind of, their grades are going down. Their academic performance has gone down. They have some sleep issues, some trouble concentrating, right? So, and 
Same thing with anxiety. When someone feels anxiety, right? Explaining that to them. Sometimes they feel like they're can faint. They have like their heart beating really fast in their chest, strong palpitations. They don't want to pe- talk to people because it's very uncomfortable for them. They have constant stomach aches or headaches or any body aches. They have a constant sense of worry, like something is going to happen. Their academic performance can also um, decrease. Their sleep can also be um, affected. So it, this piece of, of, of the education of mental health is more about educating your kids about what these conditions look like and what they are. Um, and um, you can even make analogies to medical conditions, right? And, and explain that these conditions are start in your brain, right? And the brain controls feelings and thoughts and behaviors. It's like the central headquarters. And sometimes what are the things that people can do, right? To manage this. And sometimes it's uh, therapy, right? And counseling. And that gives you an open door to talk about, hey, if you ever want to want to go to a counselor, I'm super uh, open to that. If you ever want to do that, uh, you know, and you want to talk to someone about your the struggles that you're having. Um, also, um, you know, what are other ways? So counseling, medications are sometimes uh, necessary, right? And normalizing that too, because some people definitely need medication. Um, so this, it's really about, um, educating your kids, um, because if they're, if you're not educating them, then other people are educating them. And that could be, um, not completely accurate. Um, also in this, in this moment, I'd like to add in there that it's important for you to tell your kids that if you hear, right that a, a friend of theirs is is cutting or self-harming or they have thoughts of suicide it's really important that you tell an adult that and so you cannot you know you need to explain to your kids that those things are not things to be kept secret right those are not things there are there comes a point where you really do need to advocate for your friends and you need to tell someone so that we can find help for your friend, right? And so these are just important conversations because what happens is that if they don't reach an adult to help, they feel like they're responsible for their friend a lot of times. And we do not want our kids to have that pressure. And we really do need to get the right help for um, for their friend. So I totally went off on a tangent here, but a really important one. Um, about, you know, telling our kids, if you ever see any of this happening with your friends, you really do need yeah. to t- talk to us about it. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that because as a high school teacher, mm. the word that would be mentioned frequently was snitch. I'm not a snitch. Mm. And there's this fear of breaking loyalty, but in fact, you're proving your love and loyalty towards that person. But that's a difficult thing nowadays to explain to somebody. Yeah, right? uh, for getting them the right help, right? You really, you know, yeah. You're not a snitch. I'll say it. You're not a snitch if you're trying to save someone's life. That is not snitching, right? Exactly. It, so, yeah. So I think that's really important um, to be talking to our kids about. I couldn't agree more. And uh, it, it kind of removes that stigma. Behind yeah, it absolutely. Well. Absolutely. You know, again, this goes to communicating that you're the safe person to talk about this to. If you've established that really good relationship, they will come to you and say, hey, I'm concerned about my friend. Like this is happening. And so I think, yeah, it's really important. And I think when you are talking about mental health with your kids, remember that you really do need to listen and validate right? Validate, you know, if they come to you saying, I'm, I'm feeling really anxious about this test, just because you don't get test anxiety doesn't mean you can't be compassionate for them, right? And so I think it's important. I totally get it. I, I understand that you're anxious, like, right? Validate that they're feeling this way, because when we don't do that, then they start feeling even more like awkward or weird about it, right? Like, I'm, I'm like this ugly duckling, right? Feeling these things. Right. And that is not a good place to be, right? We do need to validate um, their experiences. We need to validate their worries um, and um, help them maneuver through that. Absolutely. And you were even saying at one point that there are certain moments where we need to be very direct, not to beat around the bush and, yep. and to ask those, those 
like vital questions about yeah, suicide. Yeah, I mean, literally, and, if you ever, you know, if you have to ask, hey, to your child, hey, are you having thoughts of suicide? I'm seeing you really like ask the question. It, you know, we just did a podcast on suicide. It, it asking does not encourage someone to take that action. That is, um, statistically it's correct this their research shows that asking someone does not um lead them to the behavior so i think it's really important to you know have those conversations um with your kids and ask straight up you know yeah and, yeah. and it's unbelievable how we talked about judgment earlier um how that could be so debilitating for an adolescent Mm -hmm. what's wrong with me am I the only one going through this and yeah it's yeah, such a and I simple think that leads me to be sure to know they know that it's not their fault if they're struggling with mental health you know um with depression or anxiety or OCD or ADHD you know um some of these conditions are definitely hereditary and they could be coming down generations in your in your family uh, it's not something they did, right, to cause it. And so I think it's really important um, to make sure they know that there's it's not their fault. Um, empathize, empath empathize their strengths, right, and what they do really well. Um, and that it's not all who all of who they are, right? They're not um, their mental health condition, exactly. or, you know, um, yeah. Exactly. They're not defined by it. Exactly. And you're you're providing some tools and steps. Uh, and that would be kind of a segue into that. If parents suspect their child may be struggling with mental with a mental health concern, what steps should they take? Okay, so um, if you if your child is exhibiting, for example, persistent sadness that lasts more than two weeks, withdrawing and avoiding social interactions hurting themselves, right, or cutting, um, or even talking about it, um, talking about death or suicide, um, having kind of extreme outbursts, irritability, out of control behavior, um, drastic changes in mood, changes in eating habits, loss of weight, gain of gaining of weight, difficulty sleeping, all these things. Um, obviously, we, we have to keep in mind the hormonal changes that, that teens are going through. But when this, when these things are extreme, avoiding or missing school, changes in academic performance, we definitely need to find some help for uh, our kids. And so, you know, talk to your son or daughter about your concerns, explain, you, you know, um, that, they, that you can find someone for them to talk to, right? And, and help develop coping skills and manage their situation. So I think um, if you've ever seen a counselor as a parent, it's really good to say that. It's really good to say, hey, there was a time in my life when I was struggling and a counselor really helped me. You know, you don't have to hide that. You can say that. And that could be even more inviting. Um, ask them if, you, if they'd like to be involved in a process of choosing the therapist. Sometimes um, they, you know, you can go in the website and look at, you know, for example, on our website, we have all our bios there, our pictures. And so you can engage your, your son or daughter to look and see, you know, who they feel like they could, they would, um, bond, you know, connect with well based on their bios and, um, come to a, come to a decision. Um, and so it's really important, uh, to reach out to a mental health professional. It doesn't have to be with us, but in general, you know, maybe a friend of yours can refer someone to that they've had a good experience with and set up an appointment. Um, it's really important, uh, you know, obviously we always have this biblical piece, but, you know, iron sharpens iron. So one person sharpens another, that's in Proverbs 27, 17. And so I believe it gives encouragement that um, no one is alone, right? We can rely on one another. Parents, your kids can rely on you. Um, to be better and do better. Um, and so this could help you as parents um, to connect to your parent to, to your kids. It's really important that we um, get the help they need. Um, you know, you know, if you have resistant kids towards it, say, you know what, I need you to give it one chance. Um, I really exactly. do need you to, to give it one chance because as your parent, I don't feel equipped to handle this and we need someone with professional experience to help you with this and I, my responsibility is to take care of you all of you right your mental health your physical everything and so i really do need to take the step for you um and um and get them involved in the process so they could be more 
engaged and more um, likely to to do it. And definitely try to get your kids into therapy before they're 18. Please remember that once they're 18, they become adults. And at that point, you cannot do anything to make your child go to therapy. So if you find that they're struggling, and you know, get them in so that they can um, get the help they need. Great insights, Nicole, and just an encouragement to take that step because that'll foster self-awareness and healing. And ultimately that's what we seek, that peace, that joy and healing. And I love that uh, verse from Proverbs, iron, as iron sharpens iron, you know? So yeah, uh, I can tell you how grateful I was at the age of 16 when I approached my parents and asked for counseling. I, and their response empowered me because there was mm. so much love and acceptance and support there. And that made all the difference in the world. So. We really appreciate you joining us today and it's time to wrap up. Uh, thank you so much once more for joining us. We hope you learned about why this is an important conversation to have. And thank you for joining our show today. Again, if you join this program midstream, you can find the show and others on podcasts at Wellspring on the air or on our blog on wellspringmiami.org. The title of today's show is how to talk to our kids about mental health. Encourage us and let us know you're listening by sending comments or questions to on the air at wellspringmiami.org. This is Mario Diarmas with Wellspring on the Air because hearts and minds matter.